He's going to have a nice presentation, so enjoy it. Okay, so first I'll introduce myself. I'm Roland Gabriel. I'm uh, working in this institute. I'm currently on a PhD thesis uh, on advanced propulsion concepts and uh, fusion cooling. Um, I'm investigating, for example, fusion propulsion uh, as a means to get to the planet. Uh, but today I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit about what is currently happening uh, as an EU triggered uh, activity or a couple of EU triggered activities uh, for the sustainable development of the outer solar system. Um, and for that, first we shall actually look what we have actually already achieved. So, for example, if we have a look, uh, just like sort of um, reminding what we did in the past, um, we've managed to launch simple rockets like Sony rockets, uh, more advanced launchers which are actually uh, carrying satellites or probes or anything. Um, we have also uh, sort of a human presence in space like uh, space stations. We have already been for a brief trip to the moon. So actually it seems that we have achieved something. But obviously there is still a lot of space indeed to uh, be discovered and to be explored. Um, for example, um, we could just like, uh, make larger or more important probes to other planets. We still dream about bringing human beings to Mars to have a little bit of uh, a bubble feeling for our generation or something. And if we have also a sort of analysis uh, what the major problem in this is, why we didn't achieve this so far, is that we are having uh, some sort of limitations uh, with our space propulsion systems. Currently we are having a sort of, well, uh, let's say it's almost a decent launch capability at energy limited uh, space transportation sim uh, systems with a low CE. We do have uh, also a similar system if we want to conduct uh, impulsive uh, orbit or planetary maneuvers like uh, going from one orbit to another orbit around uh, the Sun. And we do have also continuous low thrust trajectories like spirals uh, or other systems which are enabling uh, for uh, uh, the exploration of the solar system with electric propulsion. So with power limited systems which have actually a low uh, acceleration currently. As for the power, um, currently we are mostly relying on the solar power. It's actually uh, sort of limiting, limiting because it's only uh, available in abundance uh, around the green belt of the solar system. Uh, we'll have a look at this a little later. So if we stick to the propulsion issues, uh, we can see that we are having uh, actually two um, things that we need to consider. In the past, very often, people came up that uh, high CE is actually beneficial for space propulsion. It only is if we have a look at its cost equation. But if we refrain our observation or our um, regard only on this system, uh, then we can just like say that a uh, light bulb would be the best propulsion system because it's ejecting photons at the speed of light. We cannot have any higher CE. Um, we would have a negligible use of propellant and, uh, well, uh, this might be actually the optimal uh, propulsion system. <coughs> However, if we have a look at also the build-up of delta V in a, a kinematic uh, uh, consideration, we see that uh, we also need a sort of a good uh, acceleration, uh, characteristic acceleration, over the burn period, lest our transfer will take eons uh, to be conducted. And now the question is how we can just like join the two of them together. And we figure out that uh, after a short uh, demonstration, which is done very often recently in our institute, um, we find that uh, we need to increase uh, the mass-specific power of the system. Um, this is basically making a case for uh, uh, joining uh, the research on propulsion system and on power system. There's also a little more advanced uh, uh, consideration of that available in books such as Shepard's or Arbiter Quartz. Um, and if we have a look at uh, some of the options for power, we are dismissing chemical power because this is just like very limited. And then after sort of a uh, couple of uh, uh, iterations we find out that we have two options. We have solar power which is clean and green, so to say. And we have, uh, can consider it as a sort of an in situ resource because it is in the solar system. Um, just like the abundance is maybe a little bit uh, debatable. And we have nuclear power. Um, it has a huge power yield, but it's actually also very little accepted because it's entailing radiological issues, it's entailing issues of uh, 
um, how you say, safety, um, also issues of uh, uh, catastrophes which might not have been uh, pre uh, previewed. And uh, still, I think that there might be some sort of a reason if we are doing it in a sustainable and uh, intelligent manner. Because if we are plotting now the distance to the sun in the solar system in this diagram um, versus uh, the mass specific power which is available in the various sources of power, we can see that uh, we are having three lines for the solar uh, photovoltaic concepts which are sort of limited. Um, because there's first the uh, Shockley Kaiser um, limit, which is uh, um, reduced, uh, saying that we cannot obtain with any photovoltaic system an efficiency which is beyond 30%. It's actually a paper which is quite old from 61. And also, what we have is that the density of the available solar power will be reduced by the law, which is uh, sort of anti proportional to the square of uh, the distance. So this is actually what is making the lines which are related to the solar power systems uh, uh, declining uh, over the distance. We see that, for example, a solar power system, as they have been state of the art around the 2000s, uh, were just bad and that you could just like uh, overcome them with uh, uh, nuclear fission concepts starting from Mars already. Um, with a little more advanced uh, nuclear fission concepts, you still can uh, overcome current state of the art. Uh, so, uh, photovoltaics, if you are going beyond uh, uh, the, uh, the, how do we call it, the asteroid main belt. And even if the most advanced concepts which are around nowadays are um, enabled, still we have to go to, uh, um, we, could, we could use the fission concept beyond Jupiter. And also, fission is not the ending of the scale of uh, things which you can use for nuclear propulsion or uh, nuclear electric propulsion. To have a look at this, uh, we can just like compare about the impact which is uh, made by various uh, is it um, by various um, electric or nuclear thermal propulsion units, and then at some point you can see that you can just like uh, shorten, for example, the trip time to Mars uh, to down to about 40 days, for example, which is already making uh, an interesting case for nuclear propulsion in the area in which it is still. Uh, higher than uh, uh, photovoltaics, actually using a thermal propulsion concept can, tap, uh, can have a better efficiency than using an additional uh, stage of converting the solar power into electricity and the electricity into thrust with sort of uh, AFMPDs or other thrusters. But still AFMPDs are faring quite well. Um, so actually uh, European Union is aware of these uh, problems now for a couple of years. Um, they've started uh, an FP7 project about two or three years ago, which was Hyper. Hyper provided a roadmap for the sustainable development of the outer solar system. And according to that, there have been two other FP7 projects, which are sort of um, support activity for the European Union to be a little more clear about what they are actually demanding in the next call, which will be sort of a Horizon 2020 call. Um, our institute is part of the DPOP consortium. DPOP is uh, for disruptive technologies for space power and propulsion. Um, the lead of this project is uh, Corpus Consulting Industries. It's a think tank based in Paris. Uh, there's also another uh, partner, which is uh, Space Enterprise Limited, which is in part of England. Uh, and we are also cooperating with the Institute of Space Systems of ELR Bremen and with uh, uh, the Institute of Experimental and Applied Physics at uh, Kiel, uh, also with an Italian uh, engineering group. And there's also another project, which is the Megabat Highly Efficient Technologies for Space Power and Propulsion System for Long Duration Exploration Missions, uh, which is called briefly Megalint. And they are just like sort of a competitive team, uh, which is made up of CNES, which is similar to uh, German DLR. Um, they are having Areva, which is actually an enterprise which is focusing uh, on nuclear technology, and they are also, uh, this accent should be otherwise, um, Talis Alenia and DLR Bremen. And they are just like currently kicking off, and it's more or less like sort of a dialogue. Um, we are in Depop considering more like uh, systems up to 100 kilowatt electric. Uh, um, power. Um, Megahit is, as the name already indicates, a megawatt project. 
They are also um, studying the little projects, but it's actually more that they are focusing on the higher systems. Um, so maybe I can tell you a little bit about uh, a Depop project. As time is actually, uh, it's not 38 slides, it's just like a wrong template. But you have time, so don't worry. Yeah, okay. So actually in Depop, what we have done is, for one, we have investigated uh, the technological and uh, also a literature survey on the existing systems. It's actually pretty astounding that you can find out that uh, nuclear propulsion has been already pro uh, pro um, uh, proposed in 1912. It's so to say one of the oldest space propulsion concepts around, about now 100 years. In this November we can just like, make a party on it. Um, and other than that we have also investigated uh, what I highlighted as the little acceptance of the nuclear power a little bit. Um, because um, actually the thing is, um, if the technology is available and the public or if we are just like refusing it, uh, then it's just like not really the way we can go because uh, uh, you can only uh, use technologies which are allowed to use. Um, however, in this uh, study we also just like uh, covered safety issues. There's uh, already a very elaborate uh, safety framework at the United Nations going on, which is now more and more uh, uh, at a sort of uh, approach of subsidiarity. It's getting more and more concise the more and more it gets to the actual manufacturer. So it's actually just like the United Nations is defining a framework and uh, then sort of European, American or Russian approaches need to fulfill this framework uh, but they are then a little more precise in how they are going to fulfill it and then it's going down to uh, actual actors and then you can figure out uh, what to do uh, and how to do it. As for the acceptance in general, it's uh, maybe like uh, um, uh, having seen some thought of theories just like SCOT which is social construction of technology um, that it might actually be more accepted uh, to use uh, nuclear technology as an enabler for space propulsion rather than a terrestrial uh, um, power plant. So to say, comparing it to the first Dunlop uh, uh, tire for um, bicycles, uh, they haven't been accepted in a while because people said, oh, well, it's just like for the comfortable lazy people and afterwards they found out that they can just like ride farther, faster with the air-filled uh, uh, tires rather than with the wood tires they used at the time. So this was just like changing a little bit the perspective of the technology and then it was actually acceptable for them. Um, this is actually also part of it. So actually to conclude, um, exploration of the solar system, um, it, there it's rather dark, we have, don't have enough solar power and uh, it might just like require some autonomous power sources or we just like continue with the current uh, approach of uh, making tiny probes and continuing this until we find a better alternative. Um, as for the Europeans, uh, there has already been the Hyper project. Um, we made uh, a Sleepop uh, consortium and Megahit is starting. And just like after the outcome of Sleepop and Megahit, there will be a uh, far more advanced uh, um, Horizon 2020 uh, call, uh, which might be interesting. So if you're interested in uh, contributing a little bit to these projects or to this uh, strain of development, uh, just hit me up. So, thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? Yeah, yeah go ahead. <laughs> yes, I have a question. Uh, is there any hardware research going on or is it just a general approach? Or is um, it the, the, the purpose of the current FP7 call is to provide sort of an overview about uh, what type of hardware research to do. Obviously, okay. there's only a limited amount of money, but there is yeah. plenty of ideas. And so, the purpose of both Deepop and Megahit is uh, pointing out which systems are particularly interesting for further research and uh, hardware study. Um, but uh, if you also look a little bit about, at uh, other competitors like uh, USA or Russia, they are currently again working uh, on hardware. Okay. They have already made plenty of experience with hardware in the past, but they stopped it because back in the time they had uh, little occasion to actually apply it. Um, further questions? Uh, yes, you mentioned um, the research in the United States, for example. Um, I was on a, on a conference la last spring where they told us about um, their research in the States where they were testing underground 
um, yeah, nuclear fission reactions. And um, are you, I don't know, but um, you try to cooperate with, the, for example, NASA to um, mm. to get, you know, like to have, get help for, for the testing? Or? One of the setups of Freeport is, uh, it's not just like only Europeans, but obviously you will only fund the European partners. What we have is actually sort of an advisory board, which is composed of experts coming from NASA, coming from the Russian counterpart, from, uh, uh, and also uh, other European partners which didn't join the Depop consortium because they didn't have the time to do this work. Mm -hmm. And so the whole lot of them are every once in a while uh, uh, having a meeting with us. We're presenting what we came out to do and they are making comments on it and they are also giving us advice what to research next and uh, what problems uh, we should cover also in addition to the ones that we have covered. Um, so actually in this case uh, we are talking with them. It's not that we are already at the state in uh, which we can just like cooperate with them just like uh, getting together to an uh, experimental facility but we are aware about what they are doing and we are talking with them, we are sharing information uh, also, one of the outcomes of Depop might be that we can actually just like rely maybe on Russian launchers rather than on uh, uh, Europeans, because for example, Ariane 5 will be this commissioned in about a couple of years, I guess. Uh, it's still not very clear, but um, it might be sort of a uh, thing to do. So there is also ITER in France, they are also working on not exactly propulsion, but on advanced nuclear concepts, yes, yes. indeed. Um, actually, um, fusion propulsion would be still some sort of at the very ending of the hyper uh, First of all, we would have to uh, uh, get the proof of uh, uh, concept from this ITER experiment. It's more than likely that this will happen, and it's more than likely that ITER, that ITER will just like, provide more power than it actually consumes to uh, uh, maintain the plasma. So this is actually a very interesting concept also for propulsion because if you have, for example, a, a look at this uh, um, uh, graph which is indicating for continuous urban uh, trajectory, it's actually basically just like cruising in straight lines to space which is different from the current approach of making uh, Bowman transfers just like uh, a half time around the sun uh, or spirals. Um, you can see that, for example, already uh, sort of like um, Badly performing fusion systems uh, can deliver in a time of about 60 days uh, a mass fraction of about 25% dry mass at mass, for example. It's rather interesting as a propulsion concept, indeed. And currently, there's also a very interesting uh, experiment going on at Princeton. Um, they are assuming that they'll have a prototype in about 2017 running at break even conditions. I think that this is really optimistic, but it's just like uh, apparently the 40 years rule uh, was in the last decade uh, scrambled to a 20 years rule, and now it's apparently scrambled to a 5 years rule. So we are getting closer. Yeah. Do you know the details about the experiments in Princeton you just mentioned? Uh, uh, come again. Uh, do, do you know any more details about the experiment in Princeton? Uh, I just learned about it this uh, October at uh, IAC in Naples. Um, there have been a couple of papers in which they presented uh, uh, a system which is a field reverse configuration. So it's actually not like either uh, a tokamak, which is just like a full donut, but it's more like a thin uh, a box which is containing a donut without uh, further structure. Um, it's run with deuterium helium 3, which also we figured out would be one of the more preferable uh, fuels uh, for such a device. Um, Actually, the system is a little lighter than we expected it to be. We expected uh, masses to be about around 100 to 300 tons for the device. They are having a device which is 800 kilogram. Uh, however, we are having sort of a considerable thrust and they are only at 20 newtons. So they actually basically use it to propel larger uh, structures, just like a space telescope for uh, Lagrange ponds. And they are also using a whole load of uh, spiral transfer. You just said that they are considering helium-3 and the deuterium reaction? Yes. Is really? Yes. Uh, because uh, this is like a two orders of magnitude higher <coughs> temperature than the standard uh, uh, hydrogen deuterium uh, uh, yes. uh, reaction. So. Yes, indeed, but it's having several advantages which yeah. are making uh, the effort uh, reasonable. 
uh, just like they are having less radiation. This is just like one of the primordial uh, advantages. Like no radiation? <laughs> hmm? I, I guess it's basically no radiation. Uh, less radiation. No, there are side radiation, uh, uh, well, side reactions which are yielding uh, nutrients again. So ah, just like if there is uh, happening occasionally a deuterium reaction in the system, mm -hmm. you can have about maybe uh, um, 10 to 20% of the neutron radiation which is yielding from the conventional deuterium uh, tritium plasma. Mm -hmm. However, it's still an important increase, you know, mm -hmm. uh, decrease. Mm -hmm. But, <coughs> yeah, so you can is very expensive and it's not common out there. Yeah, actually this question also <coughs> popped out during IAC, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, the Princeton people just like told that uh, they were still consuming less than the current uh, helium-3 production of the USA. So. They know, they are pretty much aware that this is the most expensive part of their system. Yeah. Um, but uh, they still think that uh, after they've made a proof of concept, uh, maybe the industry will take up and uh, maybe also this will ca uh, make a case for uh, other branches of industry, just like uh, uh, tapping uh, gas giants or something. So actually, uh, you know, once there is a proof of concept and the concept is promising, it's just like a question of time until uh, uh, a sort of an industrial exploitation plan will pop up. Yeah. Further questions? I thought you had a question? Yeah. At the very beginning, maybe it's for Barbara also. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you for your um, show. Uh, talk. Talk, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I think we have a break now. So. Um, and there's cookies outside. <laughs> yeah. I hope. <laughs>